in our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, August 10th. The record rainfall here in the Greater Seoul area over the past two days marks the heaviest in more than a century. Relief efforts are underway with priority on the most vulnerable. Foreign Minister Park Jin and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi have reaffirmed the importance of bilateral ties based on common interests and gains during talks day Tuesday in Qingdao. And U.S. President Joe Biden has signed into law a bill that seeks to bolster America's chipmaking industry to ward off potential supply disruptions and to sharpen its competitive edge. Torrential downpours here in the Greater Seoul area over the past two days have taken the lives of at least nine people, displaced many more, damaged property and disrupted transportation. Now, in response, relief efforts are underway with priority being placed on aiding the most vulnerable groups. Our Ideon starts us off. After a disastrous two days of rain here in South Korea, recovery efforts are currently underway. The military will send some 1,300 troops to Seoul and its surrounding areas to work on restoring areas destroyed by landslides, collect flood damage, household items, as well as waste disposal. Major banks and insurance companies also released emergency financial support programs for small business owners who were affected by the torrential rain. These include low interest rate loans to fix damaged facilities and advanced payment of flood insurance claims. Local authorities are also inspecting damaged sites while supplying necessities to evacuees staying in shelters. The record rainfall seen on Monday and Tuesday in the Seoul metropolitan area is believed to be the heaviest in 115 years. Amid two days of chaos, the torrential rain caused floods and damaged homes, buildings, subway stations and vehicles. At least nine people died due to the adverse conditions, while seven have been reported missing. In the capital, Seoul, around 570 people from almost 400 households were forced to evacuate their homes and take shelter in schools and other public facilities. Several railway lines in Seoul, along with riverside parking lots, were closed over safety concerns. A total of 39 power outages have been reported throughout the nation, with the majority already restored. The historic rainfall, which submerged many low-lying areas, left entry to at least 40 parking lots, 50 riverside areas and 150 hiking trails restricted. Although heavy rain alerts in and around Seoul area have been lifted for now, more rain is expected in the region until Thursday. Meanwhile, the Interior Ministry upgraded its flood damage watch level from alert to the highest serious. Authorities are urging citizens to take extra precautions as the wrath of Mother Nature may not yet be over. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. And President Yoon Seok-yeol, for his part, has offered a public apology for the pain caused by the recent record rainfall. Do take a listen. Hisengja의 명복을 빌며 불편을 겪은 국민들께 정부를 대표해서 죄송한 마음입니다. Chairing back-to-back -back response meetings at the Seoul government complex earlier on this Wednesday, Yun instructed his government to place priority on vulnerable groups that look to bear the brunt of rain-related repercussions. Calling for fundamental measures, the president urged officials to undertake relief efforts with the worst-case scenario in mind, adding that public safety is the state's responsibility. On the diplomatic front, Foreign Minister Park Jin and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi sat down in Qingdao late Tuesday for talks that touch upon a host of bilateral concerns ranging from semiconductors to security. My colleague Lee Ji-yoon has more. As South Korea walks a thin line between the U.S. and China, South Korea's Foreign Minister Park Jin met with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Qingdao, China on Tuesday. His trip comes as tensions have been flaring up between Washington and Beijing over Taiwan, as well as China's concerns over the expansion of the THAAD U.S. missile defense system stationed here in South Korea. In a bid to counter growing missile threats from North Korea, the Yoon suk yeol government has vowed to purchase and deploy another THAAD battery. However, China argues that the system's powerful radar could be used to spy on its airspace. During Tuesday's talks, Park and Wang reportedly expressed their positions on THAAD once again. They agreed the issue should not be an obstacle to Seoul-Beijing relations. Also high on the agenda was North Korea. Bak asked China to help persuade North Korea to come back to dialogue as the regime has been choosing provocations over talks. 
As for South Korea's decision to take part in a preliminary meeting of the U.S.-led semiconductor alliance known as the CHIP4, involving the U.S., South Korea, Japan and Taiwan, Fox said the decision was made purely in consideration of Seoul's national interest and wasn't intended to exclude or target any particular country. However, China views the CHIP alliance as countering its influence in global supply chains. Meanwhile, tensions have been flaring up between the U.S. and China as Beijing was outraged over U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last week and has halted several agricultural imports from Taiwan. Lee ji Arirang News. And in this next report, our foreign ministry correspondent Min Sukyun shares the thoughts of pundits here with regard to the future course of Seoul-Beijing ties, especially under the UN administration, as it, as it seeks to do away with policies of the previous administration. Ahead of the 30th anniversary of their diplomatic ties, South Korea and China are working to address diplomatic challenges. There is a list of topics that the two need to discuss thoroughly. In fact, the U.S.-led chip alliance, known as the CHIP-4, which also includes Japan and Taiwan, has put South Korea in a difficult position with its diplomacy with China. That's because Beijing has strongly voiced discontent, warning that it would be a mistake for Seoul to accept Washington's invitation to the CHIP alliance. But despite such concerns, experts here say that China will unlikely retaliate as South Korea is home to the world's two largest memory chip makers. Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix. China is not in a situation to take retaliatory measures against South Korea if the country joins the CHIP4 alliance. This is because if China were to retaliate, it will disrupt the semiconductor supply chains as well. But of course there is a chance that there will be retaliation against other sectors of the economy, which is why South Korea has stressed that joining the semiconductor supply chain consultative body is not aimed at excluding any specific country. There's also the question of how Seoul and Beijing will address the so-called three no's. No to deploying additional terminal high-altitude area defense anti-missile system in Korea. No to participating in the U.S.-led missile defense network and no to taking part in the trilateral military alliance with the U.S. and Japan. It's a policy carried out by South Korea's former administration, and China now wants the UN administration to follow suit. Experts say that Tuesday's talks was a chance for the two to understand their differences. The latest high-level meeting between South Korea and China is the first step to understanding each other's position. Therefore, this meeting was a chance for the two to exchange ideas and start discussions on the three no's. While South Korea is strengthening its alliance with the U.S., the government is also working to develop its relations with China. The latest meeting between Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi is therefore seen as an opportunity to advance their bilateral ties. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. In the U.S., President Joe Biden has set in stone a bill aimed at bolstering America's chipmaking industry to ensure a steady and stable supply and to ease external dependence. Our Kim Hyo-san reports. President Joe Biden has signed a landmark bill into law aimed at providing 52.7 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies for U.S. semiconductor manufacture and research. Calling the bill a once-in-a-generation investment in America, Biden stressed during the signing ceremony Tuesday that the future is now going to be made in America. We are the United States of America, a singular place of possibilities. I'm not going to go sign the Ships and Science Act, and once again, I promise you, we're leading the world again for the next decades. The Biden administration underscored that the legislation, which is now called the Trips and Science Act, is critical for U.S. national security in competing with China, as well as reducing America's dependence on Taiwan and South Korea for critical technologies. The legislation also provides a 25 percent investment tax credit for chip facilities. The U.S. Commerce Department has yet to establish guidelines for evaluating grant applications, and it's unclear when projects will be financed. The White House explained Tuesday that numerous companies spurred by the bill have already announced over $44 billion in new semiconductor manufacturing investments. Meanwhile, Beijing opposed the bill.
The Chinese embassy in Washington expressed Beijing's firm disapproval of the bill, describing it as, quote, reminiscent of a Cold War mentality. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Right, and that brings us to the end of part one of the Daily Report. In part two, we touch upon on the recently concluded foreign minister's meeting between Park Jin and his Chinese counterpart, Wang Yi. Stay with us. South Korea's experience in tackling COVID-19 and introduced a Korean new a Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with ordinary climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is protesters gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters? Welcome back. Last Tuesday, late Tuesday that would be, Foreign Minister Park Jin and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi sat down for talks in Qingdao. For more on their interaction and its implications, I have Dr. Pan Gil Chu at Inha Center for International Studies live on the line. Dr. Pan, it's good to have you with us. Hello, good afternoon. Right, Dr. Pan, talks between Park Jin and Wang Yi lasted for almost four hours, I believe, as opposed to the initially planned two hours. Now, let's begin with your thoughts on the extended exchange between these two diplomats. I would say that this meeting serves as a positive sign in three aspects. First of all, regarding your direct question, the longer hours of talks mean that they exchanged their opinions in a more sincere and relevant way, simply beyond the implication that they met symbolically. 
Mr. Park and Wang must have other busy schedule, so their schedules might have to be changed due to this extended exchange. So this extended exchange implies that uh, the other party is so, so important to both countries, so that, so that they are willing to uh, exchange their original, I mean, change their original timetable in this regard. I would say it looks like a favorable sign. Second, more importantly, this bilateral meeting is more meaningful in terms of the current international situation. The new Cold War mechanism actually has been bolstering international uh, politics, which compares a country to be on a specific side. This meeting happened amid this more seriously divided war. So I would say both countries mutually understood the need to be more cooperative in this worsening international situation. Minister Park's visit looks designed to stress the current new colder situation, not as a matter of being cited, but as an error to require more uh, communication. Third, the extend, extended meeting this time could serve as a favorite sign to upgrade the relations between Seoul and Beijing uh, as part of the uh, effort to commemorate the special year 2022 for the two countries' relations. Uh, it, it has been 30 years since South Korea and China formally established the diplomatic relations in 1992. So all in all, the extended meeting could be a meaningful momentum to make the current relations, which is a strategic cooperative partnership, more viable. Right. And Dr. Van, in a statement following the bilateral talks, Foreign Minister Park Jin uh, highlighted the importance of national interests in seeking collaboration with China based on mutual respect and common grounds. How do you interpret his words? Well, I will say that mutual respect stresses South Korea's status as an equal partner to China, as well as key countries around the world. Regarding common gains, South Korea seems to stress that equal and fair partnership helps both countries achieve their individual national interests. In more specific, more, a mutual res, uh, respect is not a simple or temporary word for this meeting, but serve as a key discourse to define the new rock China relations under the current Yun government. In particular, mutual respect means each party should respect the other party's sovereignty. If then, why does Seoul raise this discourse of mutual respect? This discourse means that China did not respect South Korea's sovereign matters in the past. Fed retaliation could be a typical example. Likewise, uh, what Beijing asks Seoul to abandon three nodes, as reporter uh, pointed out earlier uh, a minute ago, uh, related to Fed, is seen as a behavior to intervene in South Korea's sovereignty. Second, common gains appear to stress that the cooperation between Seoul and Beijing matters to maximize their individual national interests as well as international and regional security. For example, the, new, the, the denuclearization of North Korea could serve as one of the common gains. So Seoul is expected to ask Beijing to put more emphasis on stopping Pyongyang's provocations and denuclearizing North Korea. Right. Dr. Ban, China's Wang Yi, for his part in a statement, called for efforts to ensure a steady supply chain, one that is free from external influence, as South Korea and China have endured their fair share of challenges. Again, what is your take on his remarks? China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi's comments could be seen as a signal that South Korea should not be tilted to the United States in the wake of the recent supply chain crisis and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Economic security has become a key discourse or policy in the international arena. Meanwhile, South Korea is worried that redesigning the global supply chain led by the United States is intended to exclude China in a situation where the United States and China are so competitive to seize the initiative of hegemony in the world. More recently, Seoul has decided to join the preliminary meeting of G4. So Wang Yi seems to stress that South Korea should not join the US-led efforts to exclude China like G4. What uh, Minister Wang mentioned the need to be from uh, free from external uh, uh, influence seems to make South Korea 
listen to uh, China's requests as it defines the United States as an external influencer to both countries, South Korea and China. So simply speaking, Beijing wants Seoul to stick to balanced diplomacy or strategic ambiguity. However, South Korea is eager to adopt strategic clarity based on its own national interest maximization. Right, and talking about national interest, Dr. Ban, as you mentioned, how would then you, the UN administration's uh, possible additional deployment of THAAD affect its ties with neighboring China, do you think? To begin with, as far as I know, additional deployment of THAAD has not been officially decided yet. What matters more is how to defend South Korea from the military provocations of North Korea armed with nuclear weapons. That system serves as a small part to do this, actually. So accordingly, as Pyongyang continues and steps up a nuclear program, South Korea should grapple with North Korea by arming itself and bolstering deterrence with an ally, which is the United States. This is the real issue regarding the additional uh, Fed deployment. So South Korea needs to ask China to make North Korea stop the nuclear program and come to the negotiation table by explaining the inherent background of Fed deployment. Likewise, as I said earlier, the deployment of Fed is a sovereign issue that South Korea should design. So South Korea needs to stress on inherent characteristics of this issue to China. If China might attempt to make this issue become uh, to its relations with South Korea, it will have a negative impact on China's national interests. Beijing is fully aware that the that uh, the sad retaliation made South Koreans, ordinary South Koreans, I mean, exchanged from China. All in all, China is expected to be different this time because she learned the lessons. Dr. Ban, staying with that then, how should South Korea perhaps better prepare then for any uh, potential retaliation uh, from China in the case of additional THAAD deployment? It's a tricky question. However, if China chooses the, the option of THAAD retaliation in the same way of the past, South Korea should not deal with those retaliations, retaliations alone. South Korea needs to make countermeasures with an ally and partners by stressing unfair aspects of retaliation. Sovereignty is an internationally driven assurance that, that applies to all countries in the world. So South Korea needs to emphasize that common countermeasures uh, are a key to protecting international norms and laws. To that end, uh, South Korea needs to uh, expand the scope of countries for cooperation around the world and bolster its relations with key countries. Additionally, South Korea needs to learn the lessons of other countries like Australia that successfully re uh, neutralized the South Korea, uh, China's retaliations. That explains why diplomatic strategy matters. And very briefly speaking, Dr. Ban, what are the chances of having the Chinese leader Xi Jinping visit South Korea this year? Well, uh, Minister Park Yen invited two, two persons, but I don't think it is highly uh, possible this year, strategically and politically. I see. All right, Dr. Ban Kilju at Inha Center for International Studies, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. Thanks for having me. Right, up next, we take a closer look at South Korea's chip trade with neighboring China amid Washington's calls for Seoul's participation in its Chip 4 alliance. For more on that, I have Professor Oh Jun Sok at Sungyang Women's University joining us, joining me, that is, virtually. Professor Oh, welcome. Yeah, thank you for connecting me. Right, now, Professor, we are well aware that South Korea's biggest trading partner is China. Could you start mm -hmm. with some perspective on this particular reality then? Mm, yes, uh, it is true. A number one trade partner of Korea is China, uh, and uh, for the first time in 30 years, Korea has recorded a trade deficit with China. In 2020, Korea expected 100 uh, exported to 131 billion dollars to China. Uh, main three export goods are integrated circuit, 
machineries and re uh, refined petroleum. During the last 25 years, the export to China have increased at an annual rate of 11.1%. Uh, however, recently, uh, the trade surplus with China is showing the sign of cracks uh, consecutive with three months trade deficit uh, in May, June, and July. It's likely that the U.S. high-tech restrictions on China take a toll on Korea's uh, trade balance. Uh, what is worried more is the trade deficit are not temporary, but uh, ramification of the structural change. In the past, China was stuck in a labor-intensive structure, importing intermediate goods or raw materials from Korea and exporting complete product to third countries. Uh, but uh, China used to be the last resort for Korea to offset the uh, deficit uh, from other markets, but uh, now it is barely uh, making any profit. Uh, China is changing into a high-tech manufacturer uh, that can procure parts and materials on its own. Uh, by contrast, Korea imports an increasing amount of Chinese uh, second batteries, pro, uh, petrochemical product, and uh, textile goods. In this way, a trade dependency between uh, two countries uh, from the perspectives of uh, supply chain is getting closer nowadays. Right, I see. And against that backdrop, Professor, some say mm -hmm. the chip industries of the two countries have become intertwined over the past 20 mm -hmm. years and cannot be separated. Do you agree? Mm, uh, partly, but uh, I do not agree totally. If needed, it can be separable in spite of past integration of supply chain. Uh, I'd like to talk about the economic safety. A nation's capacity for economic safety, safety can be shown in two ways. Uh, one is trade wars and uh, the other one is trade negotiations. No wonder trade negotiations are the better uh, because trade war is a painstaking game while trade negotiation is a gainstaking game. Korea's cheap trade with other countries is about 150 billion US dollar per year, and cheap trade with China accounts for around 30 percent. I mean that uh, 40 to uh, 50 uh, billion dollars per year. The cooperation between China and Korea, especially in the chips industry, is very close. Korea is in the upstream in most fields, but now some Korean chip companies uh, have a large number of manufacturers in China for production. Uh, then the flash memory chip uh, made by Samsung Electronics, uh, Xi'an factory account for more than 40% of its total land flash output of uh, Samsung Electronics, while 45% 40, of SK Hynix total uh, DRAM chip output is produced in uh, Wuxi. Uh, the trade relation between China and Korea have come under heavy strain uh, due to Seoul considers uh, joining the prospective alliance. 30% of memory chip export of Korea goes to China. Uh, on the other hand, 70% of Chinese chip imports uh, comes from Korea. Uh, it is unlikely to go into trade retaliation against Korea's chip making industry. Instead, it cannot be ruled out the possibility of retaliation against Korea's other industry or Korea's advanced material industry, which is crucial for the chip supply chain. Right, and staying with that then, Professor Oh, how does mm -hmm. South Korea's potential participation in the US-led chip alliance look to affect its related trade with China then? Uh -huh. Korea's export to China dropped in April, highlighting the impact that COVID-related lockdown in Chinese cities, uh, having on uh, supply chain around the, uh, around the region. A divided organization suggested for the uh, trusted value chain among alliance or a, a so-called chip for alliance. The chip for is seen uh, by Beijing as Washington's plot to exclude China uh, from the chip value chain. China is particularly sensitive about Korea, uh, which is uh, key to uh, Beijing's semiconductor self-sufficiency drive uh, as a Korean chip giant Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix operate plant in China. Uh, despite the fact that uh, trade experts uh, know the uh, chain reaction of sumo solid effect, there is a possibility of uh, trade retaliation against each other. Uh, Korea finds itself engaging in active diplomacy as it contemplates joining a U.S.-led coalition uh, because it cannot afford to lose U.S. technology and equipment for manufacturing semiconductors. 
Uh, at the press conference, uh, Foreign Minister Park Jin stressed the chief for coalition is not aimed at excluding a certain country, uh, but uh, it, will, uh, it would rather be a uh, consultative body with a view to ensuring cooperation in securing a stable supply chain. Uh, as for the issue of chief of participation, I suppose the matter should be examined through the lens of national interest based upon mutual respect. Due to lockdown, uh, Korean companies had the difficulties of supply chain disruption already. It was China uh, that gave us a jab of Uranus solution shock already. As China did not show mutual respect till now, it is necessary for us to keep tabs on global supply disruption of uh, semiconductors. The U.S. made a very attractive offer as an alternative. Uh, in this sense, it is natural Korea start to join in working level meeting involving major chip making allied members along with the United States, Taiwan and Japan. Separately, Professor, there is talk mm -hmm. that the Biden administration is considering a crackdown on memory chip makers over in China. What look to be the broader implications of such a crackdown? Uh, trade tension over the tech sector deepened. The uh, U.S. is considering limiting uh, shipment of American chip making equipment to memory chip makers in China, including YMTC. Uh, YMTC founded in 2016, uh, Chinese uh, Chinese company account for about uh, five percent of worldwide NAND flash memory chip production. Uh, while uh, U.S. company's uh, Western digital stands about. 13% uh, and Micron 11%. Uh, Micron and Western Detail are under pressure from YMTC's low price. The move will seek to protect the only U.S. memory chip producers, uh, Western Detail uh, Corporation and uh, Micron Technology, which trade rep represent about a quarter of NAND chip uh, markets. It will mark the uh, first U.S. bid throughout uh, export control to target Chinese production of memory chips without specialized uh, ability application representing a wider view of American national security. Uh, this crackdown, if approved, would involve barring the shipment of U.S. chip making equipment to factories in China. If the Biden administration proceeds with the move, it could also hurt uh, Korean memory chip makers, uh, Samsung Electronics and then SK Hynix. Uh, that is because Samsung Electronics uh, has two big factories in China, while SK Hynix uh, is buying Intel Corporation's NAND flash memory chip manufacturing business uh, in China also. Right, I see. I understand this next question might be quite difficult, Professor Oh, but what do you propose to better tackle this dilemma of partaking in U.S. proposed partnerships amid China-dependent trade ties? Mm. Uh, Korea faces a dilemma whether or, uh, whether or not to join the U.S.-led uh, semiconductor alliance chip for or not. Uh, President Yoon has called for active diplomacy uh, with China. Uh, Yoon's prudence on the uh, topic indicated uh, Korea's careful calculation over gains, if any, against losses from possible participation, as Korea's export center the economy would be hit hard if it blindly joined the U.S. technology choking off of China. As uh, uh, several U.S. backbone industries have been suffering a lot uh, from the semiconductor supply chain disruptions, uh, in one part, but uh, it is to the point that the uh, Biden administration raised the policy issue of a critical supply chain. It's so natural. But on the other hand, it is expected, despite increased U.S. scrutiny, I guess it's a too far a scenario for Washington to seek a complete decoupling of basing in the semiconductor industry. Some experts uh, uh, thought that the uh, uh, intensity of U.S. action would be loosened after the U.S. midterm election. In handling the country's key trade policies rather than seeking full-scale sanctions, the United States would apply tighter control in a more targeted and very limited way. So Korea could take a role of a moderator in between. As China is the world's top semiconductor consumers, Korean government has to count in policy dynamics and complexities and to take a more cautious stand because excessive chip supply would also cause a serious impact to uh, Korean companies. Right. And before you leave us, Professor, mm -hmm. uh, the UN administration has vowed to better support the country's semiconductor industry. What are your thoughts on this intention as we seek economic security amid the volatile global conditions? A very good question. Uh, when Korea have only to follow the U.S. leadership, uh, cheap export will be in danger. Uh, harming uh, 40 to 50 billion uh, uh, trade volume per year with China. Geopolitical dynamics, 
and the landscape of trade is too fragile. China is in the middle of industrial trans, uh, transition, uh, and the world is getting divided into the backdrop of a trade world. Supply failure of major raw material or, uh, or major parts are uh, becoming more frequent. So Korea must create a technological innovation network based upon international cooperation and co-prosperity by focusing resources on value-added industries, including material, parts, and equipment. It is a mission for us to keep competitiveness and to reconfigure the current trend, uh, trade structure uh, partially weighted on certain products or certain regions. I see. All right, Professor Oh, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Uh, thank you for inviting me. South Korea reported over 151,000 new COVID-19 infections on this Wednesday, and the greater Seoul area accounted for about 47% of the latest daily caseload. Authorities say the summer holiday travel is fueling greater community transmissions. They also believe the daily tally will reach 200,000 by mid-August. Meanwhile, 50 more patients lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours, while more than 400 remain in critical condition. Employment has expanded for the 17th straight month in July. According to Statistics Korea Wednesday, nearly 28.5 million people were working last month, up 826,000 on year. The figure is the highest for any July since related data was first compiled in the year 1989. However, the pace of growth slowed for the second consecutive month due to lingering economic uncertainties. Growth last month was fueled, was led that is, by the manufacturing sector, with an on-year increase of 176,000 jobs, followed by the health and social welfare sector and the ICT industry. The unemployment rate fell 0.3 percentage points on-year to 2.9 percent in July, dropping below 3 percent for the first time since the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. Meanwhile, the repercussions of the recent record rainfall here in this part of the country look to extend beyond the immediate pain inflicted on the people and their property. Prices of food products are expected to soar even higher. Our finance ministry correspondent Om ji explains. Historic downpours in Seoul and the surrounding areas are adding even more fuel to the country's skyrocketing food prices. One local greengrocer says, the hot and humid weather has made it hard to find good products to sell. It's going to get harder to run this shop. There's nothing to sell. Most of what we see is not good quality and is very expensive. South Korea's inflation hit a new record in July as prices rose at the fastest pace in nearly 24 years. It was the second month in a row consumer prices have risen all year by more than 6 percent, which is far higher than the government's target of 2 percent. Much of the July's increase was driven by a jump in major items on people's grocery lists, like vegetables, which were up nearly 26 percent from a year earlier. Price of Napa cabbage, used mainly for kimchi, surged by nearly 73 percent, and there was a similar increase for spinach. The bad weather and high production costs drove fruit prices up too. There's not a lot of fruit for us to buy, so of course we have to pay more. It's expensive for consumers, but we have no choice but to raise prices. Given this backdrop, more people are concerned ahead of the Korean Thanksgiving holiday, Chuseok, coming up in early September. Prices are rising so much, so I'm planning to spend less for Chuseok. In order to help stabilize people's livelihoods ahead of the Chuseok holiday, the government is going to announce several measures this week. Om ji Arirang News. On the local political front, the ruling party has marked its transition into an emergency leadership framework, but it's already been contested by its suspended chairman. Our Lee kyung explains. The ruling People Power Party has completed its final step to switch to an emergency leadership. 
During a virtual meeting on Tuesday, members of the party's National Committee approved five-term PPP lawmaker Zhu Huoyang as the interim leader. Zhu had previously served as full leader and acting chair and is considered to lack any allegiances to a particular faction. And this time he'll be leading the party at a time of emergency, initially sparked by the suspension of his chairman Yi Jun Suk over a sexual bribery allegation and a series of resignations of others that followed, all of which remain as sources of controversy within the party. The top priority is swiftly resolving the party's internal feud and division and to form a united front. A divided organization is destined to fail. This wraps up the multiple steps that were taken over the past two weeks in a speedy manner amid growing concerns over declining party and president approval ratings. I urge the National Committee members to make a decision to help stabilize the party, because that's the only way we can fully support the government. The party is aiming for the leadership to kick off as early as next Wednesday, which marks 100 days since the launching of the Yoon song administration. Upon taking office, the emergency committee will finalize the exact duration. It will be either serving around five months and focused on overhauling the party until the end of the National Assembly's regular session, or serving a shorter term and preparing for an early national convention to elect a new full-time leadership. Meanwhile, Chairman Yi jun Suk, who is essentially blocked from returning to his post, has reaffirmed his plan to file for a court injunction over Tuesday's decision. He's set to hold a press conference on Saturday to outline his plans. Young Eun, Arirang News. In other news, a serious safety concern amid torrential rain is the possibility of electrocution following exposure to live wires while standing in water. Shin Ha-young has more on this particular risk and ways to avoid it. The roads are damaged by heavy rain and utility poles are underwater. The rain caused some deaths of electric shock. A man in his 60s died of electric shock on Tuesday while cleaning up communication lines and roadside trees that had fallen amid the downpours. When the rain pours down, it is important to stay away from objects that could cause electric shocks such as utility poles, street lights, electricity wires and electronic signboards on streets. If you see any fallen street lights, make sure to evacuate from the area and call 119 or the Korea Electric Safety Corporation. In flooded homes, people should evacuate the building before the water reaches knee height. If the water level reaches 40 centimeter, people should immediately make an emergency call for help. However, if there is enough time, make sure to check the earth luggage circuit breaker. If possible, it is important to shut down the transformer and cut off electricity in advance, which is helpful later when rescuing people. If there is not enough time to do this, the most important thing is to get out of high-risk places as soon as possible. Shin Ha-young, Arirang News. July this year was one of the hottest on record, with the jump in mercury fueling rampant wildfires and extreme drought. Our engine has more on this finding by the UN Weather Agency. The World Meteorological Organization has reported that last month was among the three warmest Julys on record, and according to Europe's Copernicus Climate Change Service, the Antarctic sea ice was the lowest for any July on record. The WMO report says temperatures in July 2022 globally were close to 0.4 degrees Celsius above the 1991 to 2020 reference period, which is only marginally cooler than July 2019 and marginally warmer than July 2016, the two other warmest Julys. For much of Europe, July 2022 was so dry that records were broken for low precipitation, which has caused water reserves to dry up. Compared to the to the report that uh, we released uh, in uh, July, uh, we, we, we have estimated uh, um, a worsening of uh, the situation in most areas of, uh, of Europe. Uh, Italy is, of course, uh, among the countries uh, uh, most affected uh, by, by the current uh, ongoing uh, drought, as well as uh, the uh, southern uh, France, uh, large uh, areas in uh, Spain, Portugal, um, southern and uh, eastern Germany, and a large area uh, across uh, uh, Romania, Hungary, and uh, Ukraine. 
France recorded an 85% rainfall deficit that's led to unprecedented water restrictions, which ban people from watering their lawns, washing their cars, and prevent farmers from irrigating their crops. More than 100 French municipalities have no running drinking water. It's catastrophic, simply catastrophic. It's been several years now that it's been difficult due to COVID. But if you add a year of drought, it seems it's going to compromise the seasons to come. Over in the UK, the local health agency has issued a heat alert warning as southeast England has gone 144 days with little to no rain. The drought that's desiccated large areas of Europe is putting much of the continent in crisis. According to a recent forecast published by the EU's Joint Research Center, heat and drought may lead to an 8 to 9 percent drop in the production of grain maize, sunflowers and soybeans in Europe. Yun Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Crimea, there are reports of a blast at an airbase in the region. At least one person has been killed and several injured following explosions on Tuesday at a Russian military airbase on the Crimea Peninsula. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the blasts at Saki Airfield near the village of Novofedorivka were not caused by an attack, but by the detonation of aviation ammunition stores. The local health ministry has said that ambulance crews have been sent to the scene. 30 people living nearby have also been evacuated, and a 5-kilometer perimeter around the blast zone has been set up. Staying with Russia, the country also launched an Iranian satellite into space. A Soyuz rocket booster carrying the Iranian satellite Kayam blasted off Tuesday from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. According to Russia's space agency, the satellite has entered a stable orbit, with Iran's space agency claiming that it's already started receiving data. The launch comes just three weeks after Russian and Iranian leaders Vladimir Putin and Ayatollah Ali Khamenei pledged to work together against the West. The collaboration has U.S. officials worried that the satellite will help Russia in its Ukraine invasion, whilst providing Iran with monitoring capabilities over Israel and the surrounding region. Iran claims that its satellite is designed for scientific purposes only. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's Florida estate has been searched by the FBI as part of an ongoing investigation. The search of Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach was executed on Monday, with agents looking for presidential or classified documents that may have been brought in from the White House. Trump has called the search a, quote, raid and a siege. This comes as the U.S. Justice Department has two known ongoing investigations connected to former President Trump, one about whether he removed and destroyed presidential documents and the other about his role in efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election and the ensuing 2021 January 6 Capitol riot. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Wednesday afternoon. As the rain system that wreaked havoc in central regions has moved southward, rain in Seoul has temporarily subsided. Now Chungcheongdo is the most vulnerable area with a heavy rain warning. Roads in the region could become impassable, so factor in significant delays in travel and drive safely. While the rain will continue to expand across the country up to 300 millimeters in Chungcheongdo and Jeollabuk-do provinces, and southern Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces will also see more rain up to 150 millimeters. And the capital and Gangwon-do province are also expecting up to 80 millimeters. So Seoul shouldn't let its guard down yet. And on the flip side, heat waves have already caused southern areas dearly with Gwangju having experienced 12 consecutive tropical nights. So please stay cool and hydrated. Now, nationwide rain is in the forecast for tomorrow, but it will be concentrated in Chungcheongdo province. So those of you in the region are strongly urged to take precautions and make sure to stay safe. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions.
And that ends this edition of the Daily Report. Do stay tuned to Arirang News for more headlines. Thank you for now. See you on Thursday.